Okay, now it's my privilege to uh, uh, introduce our outstanding, you know, the professor in School of Industrial Engineering again. So, so Professor Danny Yu, who is an uh, associate professor, I also has a, a joint a courtesy appointment in uh, School of Health Sciences. So, Professor Yu joined us uh, for 2016. Uh, after completing his PhD in industrial engineering at University of Michigan, uh, 2014, and also serving as a postdoc and faculty uh, at Mayo Clinic uh, in Rochester. So Dr. Yu's scholarship focuses on human factors, another area, important area of uh, industrial engineering, uh, emphasizing human behavior modeling, data analytics, and workplace interventions. His work aimed to improve safety and human performance in operating rooms and the other high-stress dynamic task uh, uh, environments. Uh, Professor Yu had a strong record of scholarly publication, which include over 50 journal papers in top-tier uh, journals. And uh, he received the uh, uh, numerous uh, uh, award uh, sponsors, uh, uh, sponsored work from NIH, NSF, AFOSR, Indiana Clinical Translation Science Institute, NIOSH, and many industry uh, sponsors. His teaching has been recognized twice by College of Engineering uh, Excellence in Teaching Award. And earlier this year, May 2022, uh, I witnessed, so you know, in uh, 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 Seattle, that uh, Danny receiving the, uh, the IISE uh, work Systems Teaching Award for his uh, uh, a course in leveraging the integration of the work systems and ergonomics to provide students with a real world experience. Let's welcome Dr. Yu. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sun, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, everybody, for um, being present here in person and also online for. Uh, for my talk. So I didn't get the memo that we're supposed to have a nice fancy map, um, but instead I do have a nice plain simple timeline to illustrate my academic journey. Uh, like what uh, doc, uh, Dr. Sun mentioned, uh, my academic journey began uh, with a degree, bachelor's degree in bioengineering at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, after completing my degree, I went to the University of Michigan um, to pursue my master's and later on my PhD in industrial and operations engineering. Uh, throughout this process, I got a lot of great chances to work with uh, work in industry or at least internships, uh, co-ops, and uh, you know, some stints in industry, specifically medical device companies like Covidian. I worked in consulting, biomechanics consulting, focusing on accident reconstruction even got a chance to work in an insurance company. Um, led to, after my degree, led to, uh, like Dr. Sun mentioned, uh, Mayo Clinic, did my postdoc there for a year and a half. And this path led me to where I am today, um, here at Purdue Industrial Engineering. This picture is a little bit dated, um, but it does show kind of my research team. And before even going any further, I need to kind of, uh, kind of can't say it enough, so thanks to the research team, uh, the students, faculty collaborators, mentors, um, college engineering, um, Purdue staff, and um, also uh, my family members. So I'd like to uh, thank Arvind and College Engineering to give, for giving me a just chance uh, to make this talk. Uh, this talk, this opportunity, is, uh, gives me a chance to talk about something I don't usually talk about a lot. Um, you know, I've as faculty members, we get a chance to talk many, many times, a lot of opportunities to talk about our technical um, achievements or science, um, but not so much to talk about our journey and our path. So I'd like to thank, uh, again, Arvind and College Engineering for giving me this opportunity. Um, this talk, probably not a lot of people know, um, and I'm very happy and excited to share today, is the talk about my journey, what drives me and what keeps me focused. As we know, all, all of us know, especially the PhD students um, in this audience, is you know, academic life um, or the academic journey is full of life ups and downs. I mean, I guess you could say this for life in general. But what is that drive for me? 
that keeps me going forward, keeps me moving? Um, what keeps me focused and directed in the right path? So that's going to be this really focus of this talk. And then I'll sprinkle in some research um, um, in the middle. So like many of us here in the audience, and a uh, you know, story very similar to many of us here at Purdue, um, our faculty, staff, our students, uh, my journey or what really started kind of uh, my journey is you know, my parents um, coming here to the United States, uh, leaving their countries for better opportunities, challenge that I cannot really phantom. You know, coming to a new country, limited resources, not knowing the language. Um, you know, maybe a decade or so later, uh, me and my sister came to be, and uh, you know, they were able to harness whatever opportunities available for them um, to support the family. Uh, these opportunities are usually quite limited, um, but they were able to find positions, jobs in kind of manufacturing industry, um, or more colloquially, uh, blue collar jobs. And uh, you know, my PhD students will tell you that I have terrible, terrible memory. However, something that I do remember vividly is you know, all the way back is how often, how many times uh, my parents would come back home completely exhausted, injured, but still needed to go to work the next day. So this really is a problem that uh, I noticed way back early on. But let's skip forward and uh, begin the academic journey or jump to the academic journey. So as an undergraduate, um, just by chance, I got a chance to see this research group looking for or having a research uh, assistant position um, that brings me really back to that, those, uh, those early experiences. They were looking at you know, how are workers getting injured in the workplace. Um, obviously, I jumped to this opportunity, um, gave me a chance to kind of you know, see what I can do, even as a you know, junior, very uh, young undergraduate. So those undergraduates here today, or maybe you know, soon to be college students, um, always take these opportunities, no matter how early, to jump at the chance, because who knows where it will lead you to. Uh, this experience um, got me involved in you know, going to various workplaces. Um, for the younger people here, um, this is something that we used to take videos on called a camcorder. Um, but going to workplaces, recording, trying to uncover, figure out behaviors, patterns, traits that may suggest why people are getting injured or getting exhausted or not performing um, at, at, at the level they need to do um, in these workplaces. But taking videos and collecting data is actually the easy part, as many of the students in the audience may know. Um, a bulk of this time is actually spent reviewing, carefully skimming, scrutinizing these videos to really uncover what are these behaviors, what are these metrics that we could find looking at these videos. I'm not even kidding, 15, 20, I don't know how many years later, that undergraduate lab still has students, undergraduate students, reviewing videos. So you could imagine the, um, some of the work that's involved in here. But that really led me to some of the, uh, some of the work of my early career, and still a major part of my work, uh, my research here, um, even today, is better ways of measuring new variables, more predictive variables, ways of characterizing behaviors, how to figure out when people are at their limits or even beyond their limits. Um, this strategy focused on more of you know, our wearables. You know, we have a lot of great wearables, like uh, what, what we saw some new developments from Dr. Martinez. Um, and how do you use, use these wearables um, as a different technique than uh, looking at scrutinizing videos? Quite ironically, today and probably for the more recent than you know the recent near the, the, or the, the near future, is that I actually went back to the videos, but with a slightly different mindset, with our fabulous colleagues and friends in computer science, artificial intelligence, data science. What can we now do with computer vision? You know, we have cameras everywhere. We don't need to put wearables or. Um, having somebody review videos, or I guess take videos, um, can we use computer vision to figure out this problem? Now, given my backstory, you would kind of uh, kind of understand that this is really not just, you know, not what I'm just satisfied with is studying, watching, modeling the problem, right? I mean, people are getting hurt every day. 
So I really strive, a big part of my, uh, my career, my, my portfolio is how can I translate and use this research to start improving these workplaces? Take our finding, take the science to provide guidelines on job design, looking at different types of interventions for enhancing human capability, um, like exoskeletons. Um, even more recently, looking at even things like augmented reality, um, human-robot interaction. All of this in seeing how it will change human behaviors, their exposures, enhance their capabilities in order for them to perform their work safer, perform the work better. Just a quick aside, I talked a lot about the application more like the occupational health and safety realm, but this science, my science, have been applied across way beyond just that uh, specific domain. Um, a lot of my work, as Dr. Sun has mentioned, um, actually took this and look into other workers, other jobs, um, surgeons, always in these high stress, high stakes um, jobs, performing surgery, robotic surgery, laparoscopic surgery, really always on the edge or very close to the edge. How do we measure, understand, monitor, and enhance their capabilities using some of the science that we're developing? Has been worked, has been done work, or has been used in the, uh, the Air Force. You know, These type of models, understanding their behaviors and capabilities, how can we train our airmen faster, better, cheaper, more personalized to their own response and their own patterns, physiological <coughs> patterns? Even everyday technology. Uh, we see it uh, monitoring uh, typical everyday behavior, interaction with autonomous systems like transportation. We've been doing a lot of work in that area, understanding the driver behavior as they interact with these autonomous systems like you know, semi-autonomous cars. But let's shift back to the, uh, the, the overriding story um, that I want to tell. How are we doing? So I can't quite pinpoint it, um, but I would say you know, probably early 90s is where my recollections are about these experiences and observations. And back then, we were looking about just ergonomic injuries, that the bluish um, color plot, just ergonomic injuries, not counting slips, trips, and falls and other workplace injuries. Uh, we're looking about a million a year in the US. Fast forward to today, or you know, somewhat close to where we are today, you know, 2016, um, doing much better. I have some concerns about the data, but that's a topic for a different talk. Um, but you know, doing much better, a lot of reduction. But obviously, our job is not done, right? We are still seeing 300, over 300,000 um, a year um, suffering from work-related injuries that require days away from work. But the number is actually much higher. What about those uh, like my parents um, getting injured but still need to not take days off of work? What about those that are working to the point of exhaustion, working to the point at their limit? Uh, that could be millions, tens of millions more. And this is not just a problem isolated in the US and the United States. It could be something that is uh, implemented or applicable worldwide. So let's go back. What is my drive and what keeps me focused? Obviously, as you can tell, it is the experiences, struggles of the, my parents, and probably struggles and challenges a lot of people here, um, their families in the United States face every day, um, even worldwide. Um, I'm quite uh, thankful, appreciated to be here at Purdue because, you know, really, Purdue embodies this spirit, this uh, concept, um, my motivation very, very closely quite well aligned in that be ever grateful and ever true. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. I can also pull up my 30 slides yeah, of technical well, talk, too. Similar uh, question. Actually, uh, no. your decision <laughs> uh, to get a bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering, bioengineering was excellent. <laughs> and I want to know uh, how that really helped you, uh, your current research, and as well as uh, the last question. Is, um, are you considering coming back home um, to BME <laughs> as well? I think uh, I can talk to our head. <laughs> 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 
I can't respond to the first question. The second question, I'll defer to Sun. Um, I will answer, yes. <laughs> uh, for the first question, obviously, all of this work, you have to really understand the person, their biology, their physiology. You know, we were talking about their capabilities. But without understanding kind of, you know, the physiological mechanisms, the cognitive, the neuroscience part, um, we're not going to be able to really accurately model it or actually find it. actually what are we looking for. Um, so that's kind of, the, you know, one of the things that bioengineering has prepared me for, is that uh, more background on the person and the person's capability. Um, obviously, in industrial engineering, uh, there we get a lot of opportunities like you know, workplace applications, um, human factors engineering. Um, those are some of the very hot um, or very important um, components to industrial engineering, and I think that's why, you know, I've, I am here where I am today, industrial engineering. So I needed to add, so the, it's my, 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 my view, engineers uh, design and make uh, things, and uh, industrial engineer design and make things uh, better. That's why <laughs> Professor you, Professor Martinez will stay in IE, okay? No, yeah, thank you for the question, yes. Then I have a question here. Yeah. So I've seen uh, that very often, <laughs> All right, so I, I've seen that very often uh, people suggest that like the best way to get rid of ergonomic issues and uh, r a risk uh, while, while doing uh, the, like dangerous works is basically to wear an exoskeleton. And uh, I've seen some people suggesting things that look like a robot that you're actually wearing and uh, some others think of uh, like, uh, like clothing. So uh, is it going to be like something like Iron Man or you just believe that Iron Man doesn't have enough padding on the helmet? It's very interesting you say that. We have a we have probably have a common colleague that I actually made into Iron Man um, in the operating room. You know, suiting him up with all. I mean, one of those pictures you solved all the sensors and exoskeleton. You know, that's actually our Iron Man, and um, that's actually one of the nice things about human factors and industrial engineering is that you know there is this focus on developing technologies for the people. But if you're actually going to have any success in making an impact and that translation, there's a lot of system. It's a complex system. You have to have you know things like uh, let's say in the healthcare, you know you have a lot of you know people, environments, tasks. Um, how do you interact? With, how do you implement technology? The culture, the complexity of what they're doing. Um, that's why we actually don't see too much in healthcare. And there's a lot of success stories of Ironmans in manufacturing because they just do things quite repetitively, um, consistently. But if you look at more complex systems, you know that's where that is a lot of the challenges are. Um, and you know, those are some of the things that our team is you know, looking forward to studying. Um, in different industries that you might like apply this technology to, um, are there like different human signals that you would want to look at? Like for example, if you are monitoring like a surgeon versus monitoring like a factory worker, are there different signals that can show when people are at their limit or is it, like pretty translatable? Yeah, yeah. So in the uh, traditionally ergonomics or human factors will break down these things into, they're, they're interrelated in, for example, more of a physical capacity and cognitive capacity. Um, obviously there's kind of inter, uh, interactions between the both, but it will really depends on, you know, for example, for physical signals, you have some of the things like, um, you know, physiological stress, heart rate, as you see a lot of uh, um, kind of exercise science using heart rate to guide kind of understanding physical capabilities and improvement. Um, for surgeons, you have a little bit more kind of a comp more complicated or different type of capacity you're looking at, more of the cognitive capacity, situation awareness, their interaction with the team. Um, some of the recent work that we're doing is really expanding to that kind of, you know, all right, how would we use this technology and understand capability, not just in the individual, physical or cognitive level, but what about the team level? Because a lot of the work here, as we're going for, again, more and more, more complex systems, it's team orientated, which adds additional great challenges for us to figure out in how do you kind of scale this to that level. Um, but the answer to that question is that uh, the various predictors and signals and behaviors are different, um, depending on what type of, I guess, demand source is coming from. And uh, you know, those are one of the challenges of trying to identify things that are predictive of each. Any other questions? 
So Danny, the place like NSF has like a call for the future work actually place. So, so what is your view or vision of the future workplace like a smart manufacturing in you know 10 years and 20 years? Yeah, so part of the, uh, part of the work that I present today has been funded by the Future Work Program. Um, and that is envisioning that, all right, you know, in a workplace where, you know, if you have increasing, as we go towards more increasing automation, um, increasing use of you know, intelligent <coughs> agents, you know, that really will do a different, increase this, a different source of stresses to the workers' population or people in general. And that it's just for more of the, you know, we could probably take away some of the physical work, but now they are now supervising or managing large teams, understanding how to interact with these, uh, being aware of various agents. Or maybe they are now left with the very difficult problems that automation cannot solve. So the future work that we saw is that, well, now can we develop assistive tools and devices like you know, smart decision making through augmented reality to guide things like uh, nurses on tackling you know, now these new problems that they have to figure out. Um, that's kind of one of the areas that I think would be the future work is that uh, you know, shifting for more of a you know, purely physical role to more complex tasks and demands and how do you prepare the workers for that. Great. Any other questions? Okay, well, Danny, congratulations again. Let's give a big round of applause for continuous success.